Um, Kathy Richardson is coming to with us now from Winona, Minnesota. Hi, Kathy. Let me get back over to you. And I'm going to unmute you, and um, you should be able to talk to everyone now. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Hi, Kathy. It's Noel. <laughs> Hi, Noel. How are you today? I'm doing fine. It's actually a nice day, which is surprising because I said it was going to rain. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Well, we're experiencing, I think it's going to be around 75, 80 degrees here in southern New Jersey. So it's, you know, we've got this wonderful warm spell this weekend. So we're, we're happy to have it. <laughs> yeah. um, while I have you um, on, I'm just going to read a brief bio to the viewers and then we can go into your presentation. Um, so Kathy Richardson um, is here in Minnesota. And she has always had a fascination for small details, the interplay of light, color, and textures. She depicts natural settings in her current work and tries to find a way to present each plant and animal in an environment that seems real or yet shows it off in an artistic composition. She hopes that her paperweights catch the interests of the viewer and entices them into her tiny world to look in ever greater detail. Hey, Kathy. So hey. what do you have for us today? <laughs> Thanks. Well, first, I'm really happy to be part of this uh, virtual paperweight fest. And my talk will be mostly through slides and a video. So I'm hoping I can welcome you into my world a little bit, give you a little bit of idea of who I am, where I live, and what my work is all about. So. Excellent. Go ahead. Okay. So if we start my presentation, I live in Winona, Minnesota, which is called the Island City. It's a city on the Mississippi River. The slide on the left shows the city and the two twin lakes in the foreground, the river in the background. So from the air, it looks like the city is in the middle of the river. The city on both sides of the Wisconsin and Minnesota side have 500 foot bluffs. So um, there's quite a bit of relief on the edges. You can see the interstate bridge here, which is the bridge to, Min to Wisconsin. Um, some views from Minnesota. The city derives most of its um, pleasure and leisure activities from the river, as well as a lot of its commercial activities. There's a lot of barge traffic. And in some of these so photos, you can see the little houses. Uh, there are a number of people that live in these boat houses some of them all year round. So some people like the simpler life, which you can um, manage in this area, which is full of lots of wildlife. My studio is in the main part of the city. I rent a space in a commercial building. Here you can see my lamp working area. I spend many hours here at this small torch building and sculpting plants and animals and building small sculptures, which we call setups like this and once they're put together I put them in the vacuum cup and I have a video now that shows you the um, encasing process. Here we're heating a gob of clear glass. I use um, shot S8 encapsulating glass And this is my son, Colin, who used to work in the studio with me. So you can see the glass is really hot. It's going into the vacuum cup, putting on the vacuum and letting the glass set up. So Kathy, what size of uh, weight will this be once it's completed? Okay, this will be a standard weight. So it'll be around three inches, three and a to three and an eighth inches in diameter and probably two and three quarters inches high. Okay. So we, this has come out of the chamber. We're looking at it carefully to see whether there 
or anything broke or fell over to make sure the setup is um, perfect before we continue the process. Obviously it was good. So here I'm picking up another piece of glass, which will be the base. I'm heating the glass. Right now I'm heating the exterior so that we can um, peel the exterior, which removes any impurities from the glass. And now I'm heating it, putting a lot of heat in it, getting it very uh, liquid so that I can put the base on the, on the paperweight. I'm kind of short, so <laughs> I need to stand up on a, a little step in order to do this. You notice we use long punties. We also do furnace work and these are the, the it's the equipment I'm used to using. Okay. So Colin's got the base centered and we're just going to take a torch and melt off the punty. And he's just going to clip off some of that glass that has impurities from the pipe, from the punty. So Kathy, when you encase do you always have a partner or do you do that sometimes by yourself? I encase with a partner because that's the way Colin and I learned to do it. And okay. my husband now does that, the part that Colin did, well, not entirely the part that Colin did. He's my assistant now. Okay, very so good. <laughs> we, you adopt a different assistant. <laughs> Here we're attaching a punty. I've shaped the bottom. We're attaching the punty to the bottom of the glass. And now we're cleaning up the top of the glass. Removing anything, any bubbles, impurities from both the chamber and the, uh, the punty. When we do this now, I actually use a bigger torch and I do it myself. Okay. And everything's clean, so we're starting to heat the outs, heat the piece so that we can begin to do some of the final shaping. And these are cherry wood blocks. Those are very unique. I've never, I don't think I've seen them without a, a, a handle like that. That's kind Yeah, of they're called marble blocks. Um, I used to do a lot of marble making as well. Right. And got used Those to using cool. these. Yeah, I got used to using these blocks that don't have handles, so. Looks like you would have more control that way. Um, I think so, but yeah. it, it's a matter of what you're used to working with. So here you can get an idea of what the setup looks like. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, it's hot. So we finished shaping it, We're checking it out, letting it cool a little bit. And it's time to cool the, the separation between the punty and the glass right at and um, break it off put it into the kiln and anneal it and how long will that take to anneal kathy for that piece it takes a day and a half to two days i usually just let it run two days so that wow look at that 
Beautiful. So that gives you an idea of what the process looks like of making the lamp working paper work paperweights. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some other work that I've been doing. As the sign says, learning and experimenting never stops. About six years ago, I decided I wanted to start to experiment with designing on the surface of my paperweights rather and rather than only the inside. So I began doing some sandblasting experiments on these surfaces. I had Jim and Ed Poor do some cutting and I finally decided I really wanted to um, begin to learn the uh, glass engravings, which I felt was a little bit more delicate process. So mm -hmm. I spent the last uh, three to four years learning to do glass engraving. I first took some classes at Corning, the studio in Corning. I went to Germany and spent two and a half weeks there um, in the summer of 2017. And then this last summer, I took another class at the Perry studio at the Chrysler Museum of Art. So in this last class, I started to work more on um, form. Wow. So I worked with an Australian engraver and we worked on trying to develop um, three-dimensional shapes um, in the glass. So I started learning how to pr basically make the bird's skull and then put the uh, feathers and um, all the different types of feathers on top of that so that the final product looks like it has more substance rather than just a design on a flat surface. So this was the puzzle bird. This is a piece I did after I got back on a nice clean piece of glass. This is the caca bird. So I used the techniques I learned. The class also involved doing some cameo work. And I didn't make these pieces in the class, but I watched the demos and these pieces were blown for me and the studio there. And I did the cameo work after I came back. I had already been doing cameo work, so um, I just simply refined it a little bit. So you can see the bird wing where I was looking at the anatomy of the bird wing. Again, trying to figure out how the feathers lie in the bird's wing. And then the left hand one are my Japanese cranes, which I had in an exhibition, one honorable mention in the Workhouse Glass um, National. All right, that's great. <laughs> so this is a piece that um, is in the raffle. It's a um, flock of butterflies. Each one of the butterflies' wings are made out of marini. And then I've uh, engraved on the back side. In the marini, I make, um, I stripe down glass on a glass core, different colored glass, and create a pattern that's inside the, um, the bars of glass. And then they're stretched and pulled and miniaturized, and you can see the design in, in, the, in them. And then I take each one of these and I flatten it and I shape it into wing patterns. This is a recent piece I did that includes some of the nice engraving I learned to do. Uh, it's a thistle with uh, lampwork thistles, and then I did the engraving around the outside so that it would uh, kind of mirror what was inside and get you to look first at the outside and then at the design on the inside. This is another piece I started working on. This is how some of the pieces start. They're greatly magnified on the screen because they're really very <laughs> tiny. These are common comfrey. It's a medicinal plant. Then it got encased and front and back were cut and polished. And then you can see um, the plant also done on the exterior of the piece. And these pieces, I do the engraving a little bit differently. I encase the lamp work design and then cut and polish the front and back. And I engrave on the back so that you start to see through the lamp working to the engraving on the back. And the engraving is a process called intaglio engraving, which means that you engrave on the back, but you view it from the front. And here are some more cameo pieces that I've done. These are cameo paperweights, the um, rose and the uh, raspberries. 
This is a more recent one that I did that's sunflowers. So Kathy, just a, a question on these cameo pieces. So when you're making the piece, you're obviously layering it and you know leaving the white on the outside solid. And then when you have a design in mind, are you like how are you sketching your design before you start to etch, or is it sort of free form etching? How does that work? Okay, it's not free form etching. I um, work out the design by putting it on a mask um, so that I stick the self the self adhesive mask on the paperweight and work okay. out the design as I'm moving these pieces around. And the mask um, covers the parts that I want to remain white. And then I actually sandblast away the white around the mask. So you can see the yellow coming through in the sunflower piece. Okay. And then I start, in, um, I redraw the design afterwards on the um, solid white and then start engraving from there. So it's kind of a long process. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a lot. <laughs> They're beautiful. <laughs> and this shows the setup for one of my coral reef pieces and then the final piece. There's another recent piece. It's an Arctic plant called stemless raspberries. And then the final piece. And this is one of the pieces that um, is in the shop. Yes. So floral bouquet on the left. You can see the setup on the left and then the final piece on the right. This one is a magnum paperweight. Okay. Which means is that, that it- a, Is that an orb, Kathy? Or no, this is a, a flat bottom paperweight. Okay. And it has such uh, dimension. Yeah, the dimension, it means that it's three and a quarter inches or bigger. I do mm -hmm. it in a little bit bigger vacuum cup so that I can put more flowers into it. So the paperweight ends up a little bit larger Beautiful. and a little bit, fuller, little bit fuller looking. Right. As opposed to these, these are, they look gigantic on the screen, but they are mini paperweights. So they're only about two inches, two and a quarter inches in diameter. So these are done in a, I have a small sleeve, smaller sleeve for my vacuum cup and um, I use them to make the minis. So any questions about my work? So yes, we do actually have several questions, um, Kathy. A few of them relate to your latest endeavor of the engraving and people are just asking like, what is your inspiration when you, I guess, first decide that a piece should be engraved, and then after that, how do you, um, what is your imagery involved? Does it reflect on the scene or, so just, if you could just talk a little bit about your engraving process. Sounds like okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I kind of left that out. Um, <laughs> I do what's called drill engraving, <laughs> which means that I use a Fordham micromotor and a handpiece that I put different types of diamond bits into the handpiece and use them to abrade the glass away. And I also have stones and um, polishing rubbers so that I can polish areas of the, of the engraving so you can get ton different tonal values in the engraving. So that's the mechanics. Um, I, tend to like to have the outside relate to the inside in my engraved pieces. So if I'm going to do a piece like the common comfrey or the thistles, where I'm engraving around the round part of the piece, mm -hmm. I'm going to be able to see it through the sides and also see it from, you know, you see it from the outside and you see it from the inside. And so I want those mm -hmm. two to relate to each other. So usually I engrave, pretty similar or the same type of plant on the outside that I put in the inside. When I'm doing the flat ones, I often add extra plants in the engraving that aren't necessarily in the lamp work. Oh, uh, so, that's cool. Yeah. And then one more question, um, back to the butterfly marini cane that you uh, showed a few minutes back. Okay. Uh, how long 
how long does it take to make a Marini cane like that? Um, it takes, well, as Gordon mentioned in his talk, there's a lot of prep work. I have to make lots of different colors because it's not just one color with black around it or something like that. It's right. a lot of colors. So I may spend half a day pulling canes of different colors. And then once I start, it takes about two hours to make the design work in the cane. It's about um, two inches across. And then I have to put carefully pull it so that I don't oh. distort the design while I miniaturize it. And then follow up question. Um, another viewer is asking, how, how do you cut the butterfly wing marini? And um, how, and then I guess they're asking, they're asking how, I think we saw the, the finished product when you went through, but they were just asking how you use it. But they were asking about the cutting of it and how, I guess you get clean, the clean, um, precision that you would like to use to encase in your paperweight. Right. Well, this, the cane is fairly small. It's less, it's about the diameter of a pencil. Oh, wow. I use a tile nipper to cut the cane. Oh. <laughs> if I use the saw, it would leave a, mark, a texture on the cane, and then I would have to actually polish each side of that before okay. I could use it. I gotcha. So this leaves clean surfaces that I can um, fire polish on the in the flame. Very clever. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the last part is just a little bit about what I've been doing while we've been sheltering in place. And yes, I can work in my studio, but there are times when it's you know mentally difficult to figure out what I want to do uh, given the current conditions. So. One of my loves is photography, and I've recently really gotten into doing some bird photography. So I've been able um, to actually go out in wildlife refuge areas where I'm out there with mostly wildlife, no people. And the Mississippi area, river area is a great place to look at birds because it's the Mississippi flyway. And there are a lot of migrating birds that go from Southern areas to the Arctic in the spring and the fall. And these were well known for having a lot of these tundra swans come through in November and in March or April. And we have other visitors who drop in for the summer or just drop in for a short while. This is an osprey. These blue herons, I see a lot of them now. They come for the summer. Also uh, American egrets. These are called American coots. Find them in marshland areas. And we have plenty of songbirds, the jays, the brown-headed cowbirds, a lot of other birds come in. And occasionally we get some of these little um, wading, wading birds who also like to be in the marshes. And this bird is a trumpeter swan and actually lives year round in Minnesota. So I've been able to watch them when there's ice and then all the way through the spring. And this is my last slide. I call this bad hair day because <laughs> basically that's what everybody is experiencing right now. <laughs> so thank you very much. And great. I'm open to answering any more questions. Okay. About either um, my work. Or <laughs> we actually do have some photography questions, Kathy. Okay. Um, <laughs> Someone is asking, what type of camera do you use? Okay, I have a Nikon camera. It's a full frame camera. And I have a Tamron lens. It's a, a zoom telephoto lens, a 150 to 600 millimeter lens. So it's a big, heavy camera. Wow. <laughs> and people are just commenting on your photography. They love your photography as well as your glass art. And um, then we had another question about um, about do you ever use a vacuum cup? Um, yes, that's how I do the um, in case the lampwork pieces in the clear glass. Okay. In the video, there was a, a cylindrical shape thing in the kiln 
that's the vacuum cup. That's the vacuum cup. So it cup. has little, little holes in the bottom plate so that it's attached to a hose and that the vacuum pulls the glass down and pulls the air out. Excellent. Someone also was uh, commenting how you talked about the structure, the bone structure of the feather that was on the vessel. And they wanted to know, do you study the, the you know, feather structure and wing structure? And when you're working, is that something that um, you like to know the anatomy of the piece before you start to engrave a little bit more? I do. I think in order to engrave, which is basically taking a two-dimensional surface and trying to create a three-dimensional image on it, I have to understand the structure of the flower or plant as well as the anatomy of the bird or frog or whatever else I'm engraving on it. So I do look at books and do a fair amount of research before I do the engraving. Excellent. And um, another technical question, someone is asking about the coefficient glass you use and is it COE 96? Yes. Okay. I okay. use uh, the German glass. The German glass, right? Uh, and German and New Zealand glass. I use Gaffer and Rickenbach and um, sometimes Kugler. <laughs> okay. So, Marcy, how are we doing on time? Um, well, um, first of all, thank you, Kathy. Um, I do have some slides to put up. Um, if you have another question, we can we can do take, that. Take one more question. Sure. So Kathy, um, um, I have a question for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so now that you are a photographer extraordinaire, <laughs> are you, do you think you would pursue a second artistic career in your photography and maybe start having photography shows or would that interest you or is this truly just a hobby right now? Right now, it's a hobby, and I wouldn't say I'm a photo photographer extraordinaire. <laughs> well, they looked, they looked it for pretty amazing. I <laughs> <laughs> had my lens for two months. Three months <laughs> well, um, well we, we've been getting a lot of questions yeah. <laughs> thinking that it maybe wasn't your photography, that it was, you know, something yeah. you, but no, it's really your yeah, photography. Yeah, it's really my <laughs> photography. Right now, it's a hobby, and I hope to maybe bring some of the imagery into my glasswork. Um, I yeah, that would be amazing. I'm a member of a bird club and I would like to maybe share my images occasionally, but more either in local shows or mm -hmm. maybe a competition here or there, but yeah. not really as a profession. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Kathy. We appreciate you coming in and letting us come into your world and, and share with us um, your information and your inspirations. So um, Thank you for hosting me and thank you to everybody who was able to watch. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Kathy, thank you have you. quite a number of um, compliments. Wow, amazing and so forth and so on. And um, since the beam is there and everyone can see it, I'll, I'll just share that uh, Jerick, uh, Jacob Erickson also said that these videos and your work were incredibly important for my, meaning his development as an artist. Much love to you and Colin. So I, I wanted to share that with you. Thank you very much too. I thank you for letting us come into your studio and sharing um, this time with you and, and all the, the time that, um, that it, it takes to get ready for this and, and your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> um, I again want to let you know that um, Kathy's work is available in the um, shop wheatenarts.org. And um, this um, brings us to a time when um, Victor Tribute, we're going to play a, a video from Victor Tribuco. Um, but we have, we, we can see Kathy and her camera right here uh, that got this past January and a few pieces of her work that are at in the shopping cart and this magnum that she showed us during the presentation. Please enjoy the video from Victor Tribuco.
Well, these are the steps to create a small flower. Carefully heat up the crystal. And pull it to a small point. Then one at a time, each one of the stamens with some yellow glass are added to the crystal base. glass is slowly heated and each one of the yellow stripes are added to the surface and heated in. And some clear glass is added above it and shaped, then the petals are applied one at a time. Here I'm just adding some pink and white glass. And the petals are formed. And this is carefully heated in and shaped. Then the sepals are added on.
and they're pulled to a small point to create the shape. Those are carefully heated in. And then the stem is added. Then the top part is detached. Excess glass is removed. To create a small bell shaped flower. And this will be used to create a small setup. In this segment, I'm just going to make a uh, green leaf. Just going to heat up a small gather of green glass and flatten it. And I'm going to carefully fire polish the surface and add the stem. going to heat off the other end and form the, uh, the top of the leaf. Carefully pull it off to a point. And I gently heat the leaf and give it a small twist to give it a little bit of a shape. And there's the completed leaf. Here's a completed setup before it's encased. And here are some examples of the finished work.